Beach Congregational Church, where we have the three H's today, heat, humidity, and what was the other, what's it, what's it, what's it? okay, yeah, so uh, it, it is a summer day, and it is also National Ice Cream Day, in case anybody didn't know, so we have ice cream Sundays today at coffee hour, so you might want to stay. So please pay attention to our prayer list for this week for members and friends of the congregation, especially for the Cruz family because the triplets have arrived. On July 12th, Raymond, Raphael, and Ramona were welcomed into the world. Ramona was five pounds, and Raymond and Raphael were three and four pounds. So I think Raymond and Raphael are still in the hospital. Is that did you hear anything new, Pastor Ken? I think only one came home. Yeah. So Pastor Ken says um, Myra and one of the babies came home, probably Ramona, and the other two are still in the hospital. So prayers for the Cruz family. Um, Bible studies continuing um, on Wednesday in the fellowship hall. And uh, next week we just have a regular service, worship service scheduled. There is no council meeting for August. Um, I just wanted to make uh, the uh, council members aware of that. We're taking a month off for the summer. Um, and the script vendor cards are due on the 31st, so that's two weeks from today. So if you have any gift giving or your own personal shopping that you would like to support the church through this program, uh, please uh, think about that within the next couple of weeks. Uh, do we have any other announcements for today? If not, let's please prepare our hearts for worship. If you would please stand and we'll say the call to worship together. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Now we'll sing hymn number 31, Holy is the Lord.
Now we'll continue with the prayer of invocation. Eternal and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your promise to dwell with us. We thank you that as we draw aside for these moments of prayer and meditation, you indeed are with us, guiding our thoughts. Accept this, our sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. And we'll continue in unison with the prayer of confession. We confess to you, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. Make us truly contrite. Fill us with the holy fear and give us grace to amend our lives according to your word. For the glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. Heavenly Father, as we gather in your name to worship you this warm and beautiful summer day here in the West Shore of Milford, we thank you that you're present in our lives by your spirit and also very much evident in our midst. We ask that you would direct us in all our ways, especially in this service of worship for you. And may we be an encouragement to these gathered as well as others who are listening in. And as we leave today, help us to go and be your ambassadors of hope and peace, love and joy. We ask for your forgiveness for every and all sin. We ask also for a refilling of your spirit that we would live lives that are pleasing and honoring in every way. And we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good to see those of you who have gathered this morning. We're missing some folks today. One pastor said he had an up and down crowd in the summer. They were up at the mountains or down at the beach. Well, we're down at the beach, but it sounds like the beach people went up to the mountains or they're out on the beach, I think, maybe. Who knows? But anyway, you're here and others who are listening in, and uh, that's all that matters. We're here, right? And we continue our worship now through our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. And we ask and pray all these things in our Lord's name for his honor and glory. Sorry about that.
this summer, but we have special music. Special music. What are we singing today? Little is much. Absolutely. Deborah picked out another goodie. <laughs> Pay attention to the words, people. The words have a lot of meaning behind them. Testament reading is from Luke chapter 8 verses 4 through 15. When a great crowd gathered and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell on the path and was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on the rock and as it grew up, it withered for lack of moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew with it and choked it. Some fell into good soil, and when it grew, it produced a hundredfold. 
As he said this, he called out, let anyone with ears to hear listen. Then his disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But to others I speak in parables, so that looking they may not perceive, and listening they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. The ones on the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. The ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe only for a while, and in a time of testing, fall away. As for what fell among the thorns, these are the ones who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. So as for that in the good soil, these are the ones who, when they hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patient endurance. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, Mary Claire. And um, if there are others that have a song you want to share, you have a song you want to share? You have a song you want to share? See Deborah after the service, and she'll schedule your rehearsal time at a time you can sing. <clears throat> so today we continue our series of messages, I think now number four, on the parables. There's some 40 parables of Jesus, fully a third of what Jesus taught, as recorded in the Gospels, <clears throat> are parables. Some of the parables are shorter, so we'll group them together. But today we're dealing with one of the longer parables and uh, one of the uh, more familiar parables. But there's always something new we can learn from God's Word. <clears throat> Certainly, growing up on a farm, a Mennonite community, I heard a lot of sermons on this parable, the power of the sower, or you could say the parable of the soils of the sower and the soils. Recorded in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Similar accounts in Matthew and Mark. Luke is a little shorter and has some other details, not in the Matthew and Mark accounts. Matthew 13, by the way, uh, lists this as the first of the parables in that chapter, which includes a number of parables. So we're going to be Staying in Matthew 13 for the next couple weeks anyway, looking at the other parables. I think next week is the parable of the weeds. Yes, the parable of the weeds. You know, it's so dry right now that even the weeds are wilting. <laughs> the hog ears are out there like this. And some of the other weeds, you know, weeds, they, they, can, they can tolerate a lot. But uh, I had another weed growing up that's a kind of a, I don't know how you describe it, but... Uh, it's, it, it's all wilted over us. So that's how dry it is. And, and I have to take some blame for why we're in drought right now. After I finished the roof on my greenhouse, I needed to extend the back of it so the water didn't run off and down the back. So I extended the back of the roof. And then, of course, there was a little crack, even though I'd planed the boards, Greg, <laughs> matched it up. There was still a little bit of a, of a crack about 164th or something like that. And so I got some of this sealer I sprayed on it. And then I was waiting for the next rain to see if it worked. It hasn't rained. <laughs> so the, work, the roof is working perfectly. <laughs> yes, so um, poor people down in Virginia, western part of Virginia, got dumped on a lot of rain, lost some hundreds of some homes, and roads and bridges washed out. A week or so before that, it was in, I think, the Carolinas. Then out in Yellowstone, they had a 500-year flood. But here in New England, uh, you can see all the grass, all the yards turning brown, and uh, it's, it's just uh, very dry. Okay, so <clears throat> in this parable of the sower and the soils, 
Let's first of all note the setting, because as I mentioned last week, always important to get the context of what you're looking at, parables, par paragraphs versus what's said before, what's said after, we get to get the setting. It says here, on the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. And such large crowds gathered around him, he got into a boat and sat in it while the people stood on the shore. So verse 13, chapter 13, verse 1, on the same day, on the same day. So the passage right before that in chapter 12 says, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside waiting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. So many people in the house that they couldn't get inside, so they're outside. He replied, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mothers. Interesting comment by the Lord regarding his family. Uh, if you um, keep your place there and turn with me to Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 4, verse 1, again it says, Jesus began to teach by the lake, crowd had gathered. That's a large, he ended up getting into a boat to address the crowd from staying there on the shore. But passage before that in chapter 3, verse 31, says Jesus' mother and brothers arrived standing outside. They sent someone to call him. crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. And then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother, sisters, and mothers. Similar wording as Matthew's account. Now, Mark does have some other verses earlier in that chapter that uh, are insightful to us as well. In chapter 3 of Mark, verse 20, it says, Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered. So he and his disciples, they were there. Um, they were not even able to eat. There was such a crowd. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said he's out of his mind. His family came to take charge of him. They said he's out of his mind. So no wonder Jesus said what he said about his mother, brothers, and sisters at this point. Uh, as they were outside the house. And he pointed to the people that were inside the house sitting there listening to him. Now this was very early in Jesus' ministry. And we know that... Uh, Later, after the resurrection, some of his brothers, at least James and Jude, uh, got on board with the, the belief about his gospel and resurrection. And we know that Mary uh, was part of his disciples following him and was there at the foot of the cross. But this was very early in Jesus' ministry. Now, I checked a number of commentaries, and I bought a number of uh, four new books on the parables to prepare for this series, I couldn't find anyone that noted what town he was in. So I'm assuming that since Capernaum, looking at the lake, Jordan River enters around 12 o'clock, leaves at 6 o'clock if you're looking at a clock, and Capernaum is to the west slightly, so like at 11 o'clock, Jesus had come down from the hill country of Nazareth and that's in between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea and the mountains. So he made Capernaum uh, his uh, headquarters. A lot of what Jesus did uh, recorded in the Gospels took place in Capernaum. So I'm assuming that this house that he was in was in the town, the city of Capernaum. So on the same day after that incident in a house full of people, his family trying to get in to see him, it says Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. And such a large crowd gathered around him. He got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood 
on the shore. He sat, they stood, and he told them many things in parables. As I mentioned, about a third of Jesus' teaching were actually the words of the parables. Jesus sat, and they stood. Now, early in my ministry, my first congregation was the Children's Church down at People's Baptist in Harrisonburg, Virginia. The pastor had come to me and said, I need somebody to take over the Children's Church. We're getting more children coming, and some of them are riding the bus, and so they don't have adults to sit with them in the service, plus the service is more oriented towards adults. So I need somebody to take over the children's church. Well, if the pastor asks you to do something, I would suggest you at least prayerfully consider it. Don't just say no, or even yes, prayerfully consider it. So I said, you know, my training was in secondary ed, high school, he's history teacher, but um, I never really had a lot of experience working with children, but if that's what the church needs, that's what you're asking me to do, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly I'll get some books and I'll study up in this. And um, I, My first congregation was about 25 people, but they were children, children, children's age. Eventually it grew to 250 to 300, and I had to rent a gymatorium of a school about a mile away that we uh, bust everybody over to. And uh, what I learned in uh, conducting a children's church service is uh, you had to have a pretty lively program, and uh, you had to keep the kids interested. And so I, I acted out my sermons. So, for instance, in a passage like this, it says that Jesus sat and they stood, and so I got a chair, and I sat down, and I had them all stand. I had them all stand. Jesus sitting in the boat, and the people were standing on the shore. And they helped and explained, set the situation. So, yes, that's what I did with Children's Church. This is not Children's Church. That's upstairs. Okay. But anyway, Jesus began to teach in parables. And in Matthew 13, the first parable is this parable of the sowers. And so I read that as our text this morning. Matthew chapter 13. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some of it fell on a path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. And when the sun came up, plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. And still other seed fell on good soil, which produced a crop, 160 and 30 times what was sown. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's the parable of the sower or the soils. Now, we need to explain some terms. The sower, here is a farmer, is the one that was sowing the seed. The people in Jesus' time, agrarian society, would have been very familiar with farmers because around the lake there was some very fertile ground and so there was a lot of farming, but also because it was a lake, there were fishermen. A lot of Jesus' disciples were fishermen. So you had fishermen, you had merchants, you had tradespeople, like Jesus' father who was a carpenter, and uh, you, had, of course, had uh, some religious leaders and government officials. But in this parable, the focus is on sower, which was a farmer. They would have been familiar with seeing a farmer using the broadcast system of sowing like this. The seed, the seed is clearly meant as the word of God or the message of the kingdom as explicitly stated in Luke 8.11. The seed is the word of God, the message of the kingdom, the gospel. 
the soils, and there are four mentioned here, was the path that people had walked on, going from one place to the next. They had to travel on a path between different patches of farms, fields. There was the rocky places where the soil was thin and there was a ledge of rock underneath it. There were areas where there were thorns. And then there was, of course, the fourth, the good soil. The good soil, which um, was soil that represented people's hearts. And the soil in these parables really are talking about people's heart conditions, as we see in Luke 8, 12 and Matthew 13, verse 19. The soils are people's hearts, represented in these four different ones. We see different results, do we not? The crops yields 160 to 30, and some gospels have it the other way around, but they all have 160 and 30 fold response to the seed that was sown. Jesus said, he that has ears, let him hear. So listen to the parable of the sower and of the soils. Now his disciples came to him and they asked him, why do you speak to the people in parables? Why do you speak to the people in parables? Jesus replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the mystery, mysterion, Greek word, of the kingdom of heaven, God's rule, the kingdom of heaven, has been given to you, his followers, his disciples, but not to them, the ones who are not his followers or believers. Whoever has will be given more. That's interesting. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Now, that's an interesting statement by the Lord. Whoever has will be given more, and whoever does not have what he even has will be taken, has less will be taken from him. Now, whenever we see things going on in society, it's always important for us to measure what we're hearing from the media and from political leaders and whatever else, how does it measure up to the scriptures? And here is something that is different from what we're hearing a lot of today. Have you noticed that uh, just a little ways back, a word started to be used a great deal, equity, equity. And equity has replaced the word equality, equality. In fact, early in uh, President Biden's administration, he was giving a speech, and as he was talking, he used the word equality and then realized that uh, his notes, as he looked down and said, equity, and he quickly changed from equality to equity. What's the difference between equity and equality? Equity is the sameness of resources the sameness of resources. And equality is the sameness of opportunities. Sameness of opportunities. Well, what, what's, what makes the difference? What's the difference in all of this? Well, as you perhaps noticed, we're not all the children of Rockefellers. We didn't grow up in those Newport mansions built back in the day before income tax. Those little summer cottages, you know, up there in Newport the Vanderbilts and the Morgans and the Rockefellers and all those people. We're not all children. Of the Rock I used to be reminded of that by my parents when I wanted something. You know, our parents, our, our, your grandparents aren't the Rockefellers. You know, if you want something, go work for it. Save up for it and work for it. Don't expect somebody to just buy it and give it to you. But what we're hearing today is emphasis is on Equity, not equality. For equality, going back to our founding fathers, was looking for the sameness of opportunity. Now, for sure, it wasn't the sameness of opportunity for everybody. And in our founding fathers, there was a lot of wisdom that uh, was only really applied to certain people. But 
as the country has developed, working for that more perfect union, those principles have guided us in developing a more perfect union, which is still needs some perfection work, right? But the focus shifting away from equality to equity, I have a bit of a problem with. And for instance, this passage right here, I think, addresses it. Jesus said, to whom must it uh, have, they're going to get more, and those that uh, don't, they're even going to have that taken away. Now, for sure, we need to understand this is a fact of life. There are some inherent differences in the human condition and all the human efforts to try to equalize things. There's some words for that. Socialism, communism, haven't worked. Haven't worked. That doesn't keep some people from trying to make it work, but it just doesn't work. Now, for sure, enlightened capitalism requires that to whom much is given, a lot is required. Jesus said that in Luke 12, 48. To whom much is given, much is required. And so, yes, there should be sharing. And certainly uh, what we saw in the very early Christians, there was a commonality of things that people shared. Uh, but we see as the church developed, there were business people, there were slave owners, there were slaves. And so the church had all different levels of uh, income represented. But this parable, interesting to me, because it states this, whoever has will be given more, whoever have, will have it in abundance, whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Now, let's get to the parable. Jesus went on to explain the parable. Well, actually, I skipped over where he explained to the disciples why he taught in parables. And he said this, the reason is that the knowledge of the kingdom has been given to you, but not to them. Though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, never understanding. You will be ever seeing and never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused or hard. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn, and I will heal them. But, he says, you are blessed. Your eyes are able to see. Your ears are able to hear. I tell you the truth. Many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but do not see it and hear what you hear, but do not hear it. In a little bit, we're going to see a connection here about the hardness and a callous things of people's hearts and the past that were hard because people traveled over them. So let's get to, let's get now to the parable. Listen to the parable of the sower. That's Jesus' choice of entitling this, parable of the sower. What it means, when anyone hears the message of the kingdom, which is the word of God or the gospel, and does not understand it, the evil one, who is the evil one? That would be Satan, our adversary, the devil. The evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown or scattered in his heart, which is the soil. The seed that was sown along the path, that's where people walked, verse 21. The one who received the seed that fell on this rocky ground, that's another soil condition. That means there was a ledge of rock and a thin amount of soil above it. He's the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no roots, it lasts only a short time. When trouble, problems, persecution comes be because of the word, he quickly falls away. Verse 22. The one who received the seed, the word, that fell among the thorns is a man or person who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth, riches, choke it out, making it unfruitful or unproductive. But the one who receives the word, seed, 
sees the word that fell on the good soil, he's the person who hears and understands it. He hears and understands it. And it produces a crop yielding 160 and 30 times what is sown. That is Jesus' interpretation, explanation to the disciples of the parable of the sower or the soils. So we got four different soils, heart conditions, four different results as a result of these heart conditions. The fourth, the good soil, also has three different yields, 160 and 30. So let's focus the rest of the service sermon on what Jesus said as he explained the parable of the sower and the soils to his disciples. Even the disciples who heard this needed to have further explanation. The seed that landed on the pass is the ground where people walked on as they traveled through from one field, one patch of garden or field to another. And those times and places, uh, there were fields and uh, they weren't necessarily fences or walls between them, but as people traveled from one patch that was being farmed and cultivated to another, they would walk on a path. Now, for those of you that visited the garden party the last couple of weeks, you saw I have a stone walkway that's the main walk. They were the stones that were around the pool that now have been appropriated in this walkway. But to get from one side of the garden to another, I frequently also have a, a path that I walk on. And that path, having walked on it a number of times, uh, the soil is hard. And unless you take a hoe and hoe it up, uh, it's, it's, it's a path and the ground, the soil is hard. So Jesus is talking about these paths going from one field or one patch to another. And as the sower is going out there sowing, some of the soil, I don't think he necessarily purposely intended to sow in the path, but as he's doing this broadcast system of sowing, some of the seed landed on these paths that people walked on. Ground, that was hard. Now, you remember Jesus saying that uh, people that don't have a lot, it's going to be taken from them because why? The soil is hard. People have chosen to walk that way. And people's heart conditions are hardened today because for different reasons over a period of time, people have hardened their hearts. People have hardened their hearts. The story in the Bible is about Pharaoh. Remember, he hardened his heart. Moses came and said, let my people go. Now, I gave it up my labor, my free labor, and he hardened his heart. And he kept hardening his heart when Moses was coming to him, even though there were the plagues, but eventually he did kind of acquiesce to it, and then he kind of changed his mind. But the interesting thing is said about Pharaoh. He hardened his heart. And then it says, God hardened his heart. So that, when the, that, that, that was it. When God hardened his heart after he had hardened his heart. And so the people... Heart conditions that are represented in the path that is hard is represented by people who, for different reasons, over a period of time, have just hardened their heart so that when they hear the word, it just lands on top of the heart, and along comes the birds. They see a meal, and the birds in this story is the evil one, Satan. I think it was a movie called The Birds. You remember that movie, The Birds? like a blackbirds, whatever. Uh, so I, I think about this. Uh, I do a lot of funerals. did another funeral this week. Actually, two. And uh, as I'm sharing the gospel, which I always do with services, funerals, I do try to vary service depending upon the person, but I always try to get, try to get a witness of the gospel in there. Uh, people are there standing and listening. People are the grave side, people are seated at the funeral home or whatever where the service is at. And I mean, I can just, just looking at people, you can kind of see a response. It's like water going off a duck's back. You know, water going off a duck's back. 
and uh, soil seed landing on hard soil. And it's just, you know, it's nothing. It's kind of like, in preaching, it's kind of like hitting a tennis ball and then it comes back. You hit the tennis ball and it comes back. Nothing coming back. Doesn't mean I stop hitting the ball, stop sharing, whatever. But uh, you say, well, how is, that possible? how is it possible that people can hear the word and it has no effect, no result? Ground is hard because they've chosen to walk that way. And as a result, seed it lands on there, the devil comes along, even snatches it up from a bird's. And so it's just not there anymore. Just not there. How did that get that way? People chose to walk that way. People chose to harden their heart. And the word, the truth, doesn't penetrate. Doesn't last. That's the first heart condition, soil condition. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The second is a seed that fell on the rocky places. Now, growing up on a farm in Pennsylvania, we had very good topsoil, but there were still certain places on a field. And once you farmed an area for a period of time, you knew where there was a ledge of rock. And you were always careful about that because you could, you could ruin a plow. Uh, you could ruin a plow when you hit a ledge of rock versus some, some rocks. And the other thing you would often notice if you saw like you go past a cornfield when the corn is like yay high. Um, and there were some areas that the corn was only about this big and it was all yellow and all shriveled up. And you said, what's going on there? Because this nice green growing, here it is a little short, yellow, all shriveled up. Because there was under the, uh, on top of the, on the, the ledge of rock, there was just a thin layer of soil. Thin, thin layer of soil. So what happened when your first seed comes up, that's usually one of the first places that seed germinates. Why? Because the rock, the sun, it's warm, and so it germinates very quickly. But because the soil is thin, not able to get roots down, so when the sun does come out for a period of time, and especially if it hadn't rained for a couple of days, there's no roots down because of the rock, and it soon withers away. That's the heart condition represented here in the soil that's on top of rock. Thin. No roots put down. Now, what's the analogy to this? I talked about the people with funerals and hard hearts and all that. Seed not penetrating. Um, over my years as a pastor, and now this September it will be 50 years at the Anna Seminary. Um, I've got to observe in the congregations that I've only pastored three churches and was assistant pastor in another one, an elder in another one. But I did learn, as I observed things, something about human nature and condition. I would see people come, and they would come to the service, and they would start attending, and they were, they were getting a blessing out. They were getting a blessing. From the word, inspiration from word, hopefully, uh, the fellowship, especially there's a nice coffee hour like we, lunch like we, ice cream today, right? That's okay. <laughs> and people say, wow, this is, this is, this is nice. <laughs> Wonderful little group of people and the fellowship and uh, they're coming in there. And, and um, next thing you know, you look around and say, what happened to uh, so-and-so? What happened to that couple? They were coming, and they seemed like they were enjoying it, and they were, you know what? I don't see them anymore. What happened? And so over the years, I would run into these people, maybe at the mall or, you know, somewhere, a grocery store or somewhere else, and I'd say, hey, haven't seen in a little while. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah, we I kind of got busy and uh, whatever else. But when you talk a little bit further, uh, they gotten enlightened, but when they realized the commitment that's involved to be a Christian, that Jesus requires us to repent, believe, and follow. Repent, believe, and follow. Not everybody is willing to do that. 
Yeah, blessing, yes, hallelujah service, wonderful fellowship, food, and all that, yes, but when it really comes down to where the rubber meets the road, they're not, they're not really into Christianity because there's a cost to following Jesus. Now, whatever you give up, there is a true, there's, to be honest, there is a true cost to follow Jesus. You got to give up the pleasures of sin, which are for a season, for eternal life, which is forever. But not everybody willing to do that, even though they get somewhat lightened and inspired initially, they just kind of back off. That's just a little bit too much. And uh, here it says, that's the result. They didn't get their roots down in the little word. And as a result, when the sun comes out, it's hot. They don't have moisture to sustain the plant and it withers away. And that's the people that um, don't have the roots. Don't put down the roots. Now, I did get this nice note from a couple that's been coming. Um, I had sent them actually, they had sent, they had sent a, uh, a check in the mail. You got to pass along. <laughs> and so I sent them a note back with a bulletin and said, been missing you, thanks for your contribution. And so I get this note, thank you for your thoughtful note, I appreciate it, so and so and I. We plan to spend some time in Long Island and up in Maine this summer, that's up in the mountains and down the beach type of thing. So we will be MIAs at Wildermer, see you in the fall. So okay, it's summer, I understand. So I'm not putting this person in this category of those that I described. But uh, over the years I've seen, and I'm, if you've been around church long enough, you perhaps know what I'm talking about. See people, they don't see me. They don't put their roots down into the word, and they wither away. Now, some people will say, "Well, were they ever really Christians?" Your parables are—you are, have to take parables and say, "What is the main thrust or teaching of a parable?" So, we'll leave that up to the Lord to determine their eternal condition. But uh, they're not following. They're not following, they're obviously missing what Jesus said about being a disciple. And to be a disciple, you got to follow the Lord in his word and his teaching. Right? you got to put your roots down into the word. The third soil condition is the seed that fell among thorns. Now, thorns are really bad weeds. And uh, the bad thing about them is they really will choke out uh, the good seed and the plants that you that you planted. Now you say, well why would a why would a farmer sow seed where there are thorns? Again, he's broadcasting some of them might invariably land this on a hard place. Some of them might land where there was a ledge of rock. Some might land but a lot of times, you know, the the thorns are weed seeds in the ground. And even though you kind of like stir up the ground before you plant, and what they tended to do there, they would, before they sowed the seed, they plowed, no, no, they sowed the seed, then they plowed up. But what you do is you stir up, you stir up those weed seeds that are in the ground, and weed seeds can last for years, and uh, decide to, what seed you planted, the weed seeds come up. And where there were thorns, and that's why you, if you got really bad thorns, you want, to, you want to remove those things before they turn into seeds. In fact, like in, in some states, there's laws about uh, people needing to, being held responsible if they got these uh, th thorns and thistles that grow. Because if the seeds, you know, go into seed and then the wind blows them, uh, the neighbor ends up with them. And it just spreads. That's, that's the way it works, right? So... I don't necessarily think that the, the sower sowed the seed where there were thorns, but thorns came up where the seed was sown. We're going to see it in the parable of the weeds uh, about that. So anyway, here's the situation with the soil condition of the thorns. Jesus said two things about this. These thorns are the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth or riches. The thorns. 
are two things. The worries of this life. Anybody identify with the worries of this life? Well, any of those. I got a phone call from my daughter the other day. She calls me and says, Dad, I'm having a terrible morning. I was going to the gym for a personal training and my car started, the lights started flashing and the thing started shuddering. And, and she says, you know, I managed to barely limp into the garage. And now I sit in the garage and thankfully a friend loaned her a vehicle because she had to go over to Fairfield and do hair for some wedding and uh, needed to get back. And she's, I said, well, Thankfully, it didn't happen the week before when you were down at Cape May on the way back. It happened right where you're living, and you could limp in. And thankfully, the mechanic, called technicians these days because about 600 computers in every car, uh, they, 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 they said they would get right on it. And guess what? By early afternoon, the car was fixed. But you know, that sort of messed up her day. Messed up her day. She had a day all planned, right? But... That's an example of one of the worries of this life, mechanical stuff. You can count on Murphy's Law, right? Anything that can go wrong is going to go wrong at the worst possible time. That's the worries of this life. So some other worries we're dealing with. Is the COVID-19, how many variants? These, how many variants have we already dealt with in this? It's, it's the pandemic that keeps giving. It's just at the time you think it's gone away, it's, it's now another form of it. And so that's certainly we've been dealing with this for about two and a half years. It's part of the worries of this life. 9% inflation. And if you calculate for most people with the main drivers, gas and food, it's probably double that. I heard one guy in the news said, families, whatever you're buying today, $500 a month more than last year at this time. That's one of the worries of this life. Now, I got another letter this week from somebody. <laughs> I won't identify who it is. I like this eagle in there. Right? Uh, oh, here, there's a check in there. Okay, I'll pull up. Okay. Okay, put this right over there. It says, uh, dear church members, sorry I haven't been to church. Watch the service online. Thank you so much for that. Sending my offering for the month. Sorry as things are getting tight with my wallet. Pray God bless you all. We'll be back when I can. Well, 9% inflation, senior citizen living on fixed income, that's uh, one of the worries of this life, is it not? We're dealing with that today, and the people that are most affected by it are senior citizen like that individual, uh, people working on uh, minimum wage, uh, the rich people that, see, they just find some other way. That's not a big deal for them. But uh, and even the upper middle class, they struggle along, you know. But it's the, uh, you don't hear much about the working class anymore. Everybody's in the middle class. Well, the working class is where the most of the people are. And uh, unless you got a 10% raise, folks, you're losing out with inflation. That's one of the worries of this life. And then there's other stuff. The drought right now. I mean, I'm having to water my garden every day. Next month's water bill will be in. And the water bill's coming monthly now instead of quarterly, right? Like I needed to pay another thing quarterly. I go, monthly was a whole lot, quarterly was a whole lot better. But anyway, uh, we got drought here. We got floods elsewhere. Worries of this life. Man's life is full of troubles, Job said, as sure as the sparks fly upward. I don't know why, Bill, why the sparks fly up, but that's just a fact. Eventually they come down, but, and a grinder, <laughs> well, that's, that's just a lot, part of life, the worries of this life, we can all identify, can we not? And that's why we need inspiration to deal with the worries of the, and then there's the deceitfulness of wealth or riches. What's the deceitfulness of wealth? I'll tell you what it is. It's never enough. Whatever you get is never enough. You think you get a little bit more? You get something newer, bigger, and better? You will be satisfied. No. The deceitfulness of wealth is a little more, bigger, and better doesn't satisfy. That's false advertising. And we hear 
plenty of that today. I mean, the whole thing in business was to find a need and fill it, or create a need and fill it. And that's a lot of it is create a need, getting people to realize you got to replace your phone with some other kind of phone. It's computers at $1,200. Are you kidding me for a phone? <laughs> oh, thank you. The deceitfulness of wealth is never enough. It's never enough. People just don't listen to a lady the other day on television. She was saying, you know, she fell in this trap of just for a few dollars, you could take out a credit card at the store. It's just a couple, you know, a few dollars to make a payment. And then she goes to another store, gets another credit card. Oh, I can handle that, a couple more, a little bit more. And then after a while, all these bills started coming in, along with all the other worries of this life inflation. And she, she had to like refinance it. She said, I went to a new policy. If I don't have money, I don't buy it. Wow, that's a good idea. <laughs> don't have the money, I don't buy it. What? Because the deceitfulness of wealth is that you're just never satisfied. There's always something bigger and better. I'll never forget. I, I got this out of college, out of my own apartment. I got myself this really fantastic stereo setup. Okay? And after I listened to about three or four of the set tapes on and all that. It was like, then I, there was something bigger than that and better than that. A marriage counseling situation over the years, I always tell people, I'm here to do service after the sale, you know? And if you ever have some issues that you can't work out together, I'm a lot cheaper than a lawyer, call me up, we'll have a pastoral counseling session. So this couple came to see me and I said, what's the, what's the issue we're dealing with? Well. We need to get a stereo. He wants to get a boom box for $70, and he wants, she wants to get a stereo set up for $700. This was back in the day. Okay, I don't want to repeat it. Then. $70 for $700, and they couldn't come up with a, a solution to that. Uh, but the problem is, there's always something bigger and better. In cars or whatever else, phones, uh, that's the deceitfulness of wealth. Happiness is not getting what you want, it's wanting what you got. Wanting what you got and being, and being satisfied. Because otherwise, you know, that Adam and Eve, they saw that, they saw that fruit. And that looked pretty good. The more they looked at it, the better it looked. The deceitfulness of wealth. It chokes out. And so the crop is not as productive as it might be. Why? Because of these weeds, these really bad weeds, the thorns. And then there's finally the seed that fell on good soil. Good ground is a heart condition that is responsive. Now, this is what Matthew says. Listen and understand. Mark says, listen and accept. And Luke says, listen and hold to. So a good soil, a heart condition, is one that understands accepts and holds to the teachings of the Word of God. And if you do that, there's going to be a response. There's going to be a return. 160 and 30-fold. Now, notice the difference there. And that's another fact of life that we talked about earlier about those that have a lot, those that have nothing or a little. We really can't change that. There is going to be a different response or yield. The important thing is, are you living up to the potential of what you can be? No shame in being a 30-fold return. Right? Don't compare yourself to a 60 or 100. Be the best 30-fold return you can be. And if you're in the 60-fold category, again, remember the story about the parable of the talents? Well, we're going to have a sermon on that coming up. but. Uh, five, two, and one that was given out. And when they had the five, well, that's next, next time sermon, okay? There's a difference in the response. But don't compare yourself as 30 to the 100 or the 60, or if you're the 60 with the 100. Be the best you can be. Be the best you can be. Now, you can cultivate and fertilize and water and whatever else, but there's gonna be different results. But just be the best you can be. Understand, accept, and hold to the teachings of the Word of God.
That is the parable of the soils. And I, looking at the congregation today and those no doubt that are listening, I, I doubt that there's any people here that fit into the pest category. But, and I don't think even looking here in the summertime that there's uh, anybody pretty much where there's, they get the roots down and uh, they're in a the rocky soil. But I think we can all identify with uh, the thorns, the weeds, the things that choke things out, the worries of this life, and the deceitfulness of wealth. We all can, can deal with that and understand that, can we not? But the most important thing is, are we being faithful? Are we producing the response to the seed the Lord has sown? Whatever it is, 30, 60, or 100, let's be the best we can be for his honor and for his glory. He has ears to hear, let him hear. Let us pray. Father, we, we thank you for this teaching. It's a very practical word, something that people then could have understood, especially as it was explained by you and those of us now 2,000 years later in a different time and culture. Help us to understand and to appropriate this passage, this text, this teaching, this parable to our lives. And as we deal with life, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, help us to have the wisdom of your scripture and word to know how to respond. And help us to respond in the capacity that uh, you've intended or designed us to be for your honor and glory, for the kingdom's sake. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn now before our joys and concerns is number 174, Open My Eyes That I May See, a very appropriate hymn for this time, 174. need to correct what was said earlier about the children and the mother and who got home. We thought maybe the girl and the mother got home, but what's the status? Are we on? Can you hear me now? 
Okay, here we are. Um, so, the babies were born on Tuesday. Uh, timing, if you ask Jean, she will probably tell you the timing better than I, than I know. I thought it was about 1.30, it's probably about 11.30, 12. Uh, Raymond was first, smallest, about three pounds. Uh, Ramon was second, he's about four pounds, and Raina was about five. Raina, the girl, was in a sack by herself, so she had the best accommodations. Um, Ramon came home yesterday, and not Raina, so oh. uh, he was doing the best health-wise. They didn't get home last night till about 9.30. So Carol and myself have been preparing the house for this. Everyone has been picking on me that I'm moving to the basement. Best move ever. <laughs> Even the dog likes it. Raymond. Rain is still there. Rain is still there. And uh, Raymond is still there. Yes, and Myra came home also very sore. I, I'm in the basement. Sleeping till 7 and 10 after 7. So the dog and I are doing pretty good. But uh, yes, so everyone is healthy. Um, again, we'll find out more today whether they're coming home during the week or, or not. But yeah, everyone is doing well. The fluids, they're off of machines. It's just, I guess they're keeping an eye on Raymond's blood sugar level. And I guess at one point, Raina may have had a fluid on the lungs or something like that. So that's what they're keeping an eye on. That's great. Well, congratulations to you and your whole family. That's wonderful. Yes, instant family. Yes, yes, instant family for sure. God bless them all. <laughs> um, are there any other uh, requests for prayer? Joys or concerns? Okay, this is actually from Jeannie, who's working with the children. She left a note here. Uh, Linda and Joe's daughter-in-law, Maureen Wellen, had an allergic reaction to medication and had to go to the hospital and an anaphylactic shock thing. So pray uh -huh. for Maureen. Also, this is very bad time for Maureen, as her mother is doesn't have too many weeks left to live. So keep Maureen and Richie in your prayers. Um, I had a call from Debbie Murray this week. Uh, just keep her and her son and daughter in prayer. There's some health issues still, and uh, they'd really appreciate your prayers. Ah. Yep, she's still in a nursing home in Branford, and I think they are keeping her very busy with physical therapy. Anyone else? All right, I guess we'll take these concerns um, in prayer. We're able to pray for not only ourselves, but more importantly, we can pray for others and we can pray for uh, the work of the kingdom here as well as around the world. We do continue to pray for people who are dealing with this uh, COVID thing and other variants and its impact on people's health, uh, for people struggling uh, with the just uh, cost of living, et cetera. But uh, we think of the people in the Ukraine who are uh, under great distress in war, loss of life, of homes, of property, of business. And so we, we, pray for, we pray for a conclusion, an end of those hostilities. And uh, just uh, uh, we 
pray especially for the believers that are there struggling as well. We thank you for the privilege of asking you for things. So we, we pray for these little ones that have been born, that you help them to arrive at your time home and be able to grow. And uh, for those families that are struggling, trying to find a formula uh, for little ones, we ask that that would be solved as well. So now we close this time of prayer by praying the way your son taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we those who trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Our parting hymn is number 436, Take My Life and Let It Be, 436. Father, we ask that you would indeed go with us, enable us as we do go to share the seed, sow the word. This week, we'll leave the results up to you, but help us to be faithful in sowing it. And we ask and pray this in Jesus' name.